have been discussing uh, uh, analysis of two dimensional continua. Uh, so, we will continue with that. So, what we did in the previous uh, uh, lecture was we considered a triangular element. So, this element has 3 nodes 1, 2, 3 and at each node there are 2 degrees of freedom. So, this is a 3 noded element with 6 degrees of freedom. So, the field variables are u and v which are functions of x, y and t and we interpolate the field variable in terms of the nodal values. That means, u is interpolated in terms of u1, u2, u3 and v is interpolated in terms of v1, v2, v3 and the interpolation functions are uh, derived. So, that for example, the interpolation function n 1 at this node will have value 1 and at these 2 nodes it will have value 0 and in this particular case uh, we use linear interpolation functions. We also discussed uh, rectangular plane stress element again the field variables here are u and v. This element has 4 nodes 1, 2, 3, 4 and at each node there are 2 degrees of freedom therefore, it is a 8 noded uh, sorry 4 noded element with 8 degrees of freedom. Now, to facilitate uh, the development of the element uh, we made a coordinate transformation. So, if you recall the elements of stiffness and mass matrices for the element uh, have to be evaluated by carrying out these integrations. Uh, this is stiffness and this is uh, this is stiffness matrix this is a mass matrix. So, to facilitate this integration uh, we transform this rectangular region to a square region so that integration can be done from minus 1 to plus 1. Now, in the examples that we have considered so far it has been possible for us to evaluate these integrals in closed form, but this may not be uh, always possible. For example, if you have a quadrilateral element or a triangular element with curved edges or a quadrilateral element with curved edges like this, uh, evaluation of these integrals will not be straightforward. So, it, it becomes necessary to uh, deal with two complexities one is the complexity associated with the geometry and the complexity associated with evaluation of these integrals. So, these two issues we will try to uh, take a look in today's class. So, we will consider to start with a linear quadrilateral element. So, this has 4 nodes uh, this is a coordinate system u and v x and y and u and v are the displacement fields u is along x and v is along y and uh, this is the quadrilateral element uh, with nodes 1, 2, 3, 4 and uh, the nodal coordinates are x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3 and x4, y4. Now, we need to now approximate the field variable u and v variables u and v within this domain. Now, what we do is we introduce a transformation uh, so that a point in x, y here gets mapped to a new set of coordinates x i and eta that we have to introduce now what th these are and th this coordinate transformation is implemented exclusively for the purpose of evaluating these integrals. We will see what uh, uh, transpires uh, when we uh, when we implement this trans uh, transformation. The main idea is to uh, you know introduce this transformation to facilitate evaluation of the integrals. The stiffness matrix is given by this and the uh, mass matrix is given by this. Now, the transformation that we are doing is from uh, x y is taken to psi eta therefore, we can uh, consider the transformation in the mathematical form as x is a function of x i and eta y is a function of x i and eta. Now, following the way we represent the field variables we write now for this x and y uh, uh, this expression where what we are doing is x of psi comma eta is being evaluated in terms of its nodal values and interpolation functions. Similarly, y is interpolated in the similar manner. So, what we are going to do is we are going to use the same interpolation functions that we used for representing the uh, field variables to represent the geometry also that is geometry of this transformation. Now, if you recall the n 1, n 2, n 3, n 4 for uh, uh, for this configuration we have arrived uh, we have shown that this is that is of this form and compactly for all the 4 indices 1, 2, 3, 4 we have obtained this in the previous lecture. So, we will use this now here. Now, 
let us consider the line 2 3 hmm, and this line 2 3. Now, we want to investigate what is the relationship between the 2. So, let us consider the line connecting x 2 y 2 to x 3 y 3. Upon making the transformation uh, x x equal to psi comma eta and y equal to y of psi comma eta, uh, how does this line gets mapped? Or alternatively we can ask uh, if this is a transformation we are using what happens to this line 2 3 in this configuration. Whichever way you look at uh, uh, we will find the, uh, uh, the answer to the required question. Now let us therefore consider the line x i equal to 1 connecting 1 minus 1 and 1 uh, comma 1 that means x i equal to 1 this line. Now x i uh, at the one of the uh, vertices uh, the coordinates are 1 comma minus 1 so what happens to x there x is x1 into n1 plus x2 into n2 x3 x4. Now uh, how does these uh, shape functions behave except this n2 all other shape functions will be 0 so this becomes x2. Similarly uh, you can write the value of y x i comma eta that means where where does this vertex 1 comma minus 1 in this coordinate system go in the original coordinate system. So, x has gone to I mean uh, this <coughs> okay, let us see x 2 we have found out similarly y will go to y 2 that means if I am considering 1 minus 1 that means the second point here it is going to uh, 2 here. Similarly, the other vertex 1 comma 1 you can verify that this goes to x 3 comma y 3. Now, between these two points does the variation remain linear or not that is the next question we have to see. Now, consider the line x i equal to 1 hmm, which is that line this line x i equal to 1. Now, x of psi comma eta is x 1 n 1 eta and wherever x i is 1 x i is there I will write it as 1. So, I get this uh, expression ok I am simply putting for x i 1 then uh, I will use the properties of these uh, functions and I will be able to show that this is given by uh, this expression it is a linear function of eta. Similarly, the y coordinate also get mapped to uh, another linear function of eta and I get x and y to be this. Now, I can eliminate eta from this and get the equation in x y plane what it is. So, if you do that uh, I get y minus this equal to this minus this. Uh, so, what I am doing is this I am taking to the left side this to the left side and dividing this 1 plus eta gets cancelled this is what I get. Now, this is actually the equation of straight line passing through x 2 y 2 and x 3 y 3. So, we conclude that line 2 3 in figure A is transformed to line 2 3 in figure B that means 2 3 is mapped to 2 3. So, we can summarize this this is the line 2 3 which comes here psi equal to 1 psi equal to 1 is this line that comes here eta equal to 1 is this line it comes here psi equal to minus 1 is this line it comes here and 1 2 is eta equal to minus 1 that comes here. So, that means that this quadrilateral is getting mapped to this through the transformation that we are proposing. So, these transformations of coordinates uh, that is x psi comma eta uh, in terms of e, uh, n and uh, nodal values of x and nodal values of y for y uh, this is quite similar to the transformation on field variable this is what I have been pointing out uh, this is a field variable uh, uj of t are the nodal values which are the degrees of freedom in our finite element model. That is what we conclude from this is the same interpolation functions these nj's are being used to represent both the field variables as well as the geometric variables. The displacement field and the geometry of the element are getting represented through the same sets of same set of interpolation functions. The resulting element formulation is called isoparametric formulation ok fine. So, uh, what we have achieved is we have mapped a quadrilateral to a square. So, when we are performing integration 
uh, instead of performing over a caudal lateral which can be quite uh, you know unwieldy uh, we have now the neat situation of being uh, able to integrate over a square region. But what about the integrand how does that behave. So let us consider the evaluation of uh, the mass and stiffness matrices by transforming x y to uh, psi comma eta coordinates uh, this, this transformation we will now implement. So we will we need to digress a bit now to understand what the problem is. So first is we will consider uh, a function f of x y uh, in um, Cartesian coordinates and using this transformation x i eta uh, if we map uh, x and y to x i and eta what is the rule of transformation see this is the rule as you may be knowing but how does it really originate. To be able to do that let us consider a point this point with a position vector r in x y plane. So that is r is i x plus j y. Now psi and x are functions psi and eta, uh, eta are functions of x and y. So now I want uh, that is this this is a psi and this is a eta some coordinates okay. So now I want to uh, deal with this situation. Uh, so what is dou r by dou psi it is i dou x by dou psi plus j dou y by dou y by dou psi where i and j i j k are unit vectors along x y and z respectively. Similarly dou r by dou eta is i dou x by dou eta plus j dou y by dou eta a b the line a b if you see is what is this. So this plus this is equal to this this is a vector sum. So if you are looking at a b it is simply the difference between the two which is this dou r by dou psi into d psi. Similarly if you look a d it is the vector difference of this and this position vector of d and position vector of a and that uh, a d is this. Now the area element d a is given by the triple uh, product uh, of th these two um, uh, position vectors and the k along this this gives the area this is a result from uh, vector algebra so you have you can recall that. And if we do that and now put uh, substitute for dou r by dou psi and dou r by dou eta the quantities that we have just now derived and this itself can be expressed as a determinant. See we have shown just here dou r by dou psi and dou, dou r by dou eta and this is what I am substituting here and implement this cross product you, you should know the rule of cross product and the dot product. So if you do that you get this expression. Now this quantity inside this uh, parenthesis can be written as a determinant. And the matrix associated with this is the Jacobian matrix, and this is a determinant of the Jacobian. So d a is therefore Jacobian of the transformation into d psi d eta. Therefore, i is integral f of x y dx dy a becomes now minus one to plus one. This. Now, that is one first part of our digression. The second is uh, the question of numerical integration. So you may be familiar with uh, trapezoidal rule, Simpson rule uh, and Newton Coates formula etc. Uh, but we will consider what are known as Gauss quadrature rules and I will explain what the rationale of uh, those rules are. Uh, so let us consider for sake of discussion an evaluation of an integral i cap a to b f of x dx. First let us transform x into to a new variable u so that the limits of integration are from minus half to plus half. So what I will do I will substitute u as alpha x plus beta alpha and beta are the two parameters which I do not know. So when we have we are at the lower limits I want this to be my, uh, minus half so I want u to be minus half when x is a and u to be plus half when x is b. So that helps, uh, helps us to solve for alpha and beta and the transformation I am looking for is given by this. So if you substitute that into this equation. I will get minus half to plus half f of this u now b minus a du. So um, this is equal to b minus a into i where i is this integral. So I call this f of b minus a u uh, plus a plus b by 2 as phi of u du. So we will focus our attention on uh, discussing how to evaluate this integral. So now what I wish to do is I have this function phi of u and this is my u axis from minus half to plus half. 
I want to evaluate this function at some sets of points u1, u2, some un and I want to attach a weight weight r1 to phi of u1, r2 to phi of u2 and be able to evaluate this integral. So, I am looking for evaluation of i by using uh, this representation. So, the effort here uh, will be spent in evaluating phi of u. So, any integration method that we use if, if we should get the ideal integration scheme is get a good approximation for i with minimum number of evaluation of phi of u or in other words if uh, if you evaluate say phi at say 10 points which is the best way that I can combine them right for any other combination uh, you know you can use trapezoidal rule and things like that then you can evaluate r but then you are constraining yourself uh, to place ui's in a particular manner. So the weighting factor also can be optimized. Now the question is therefore how to select n that means how many number of points how to select these weights and where to place these points where I am going to evaluate these functions uh, so that I get a good approximation to i. You keeping this uh, uh, ui plus 1 minus ui as a constant that means you, uh, you sample it at a constant uh, uh, step size uh, that may not be the ideal situation because that depends on how this function varies okay it may not lead to the best solution always. Now assuming that phi of u is continuous between minus half and half we write now a power series expansion convergent power series expansion in this form. <coughs> so in this form now this minus half to plus of f phi of u du now for phi of u I substitute this summation assumed summation which is this 0 to infinity a m u m du and upon performing integral I get this. So I can evaluate these terms and in terms of the unknowns a0, a1, a2 etc I can get an expansion like this for the integral. Now so this expansion we have got now we, we have this power series representation for phi of u now if I evaluate phi of u at ui this will be the representation okay now uh, therefore now I will substitute this into the representation that we are using so phi of u du is approximately this this is what is our proposition and for phi of ui I will write this expansion this is what I get so I get now uh, a representation I will interchange the order of summation and I will get a summation integral uh, I mean representation like this. So in long hand if you expand this r1 into this infinite number of terms r2 into infinite number of terms so on and so forth. Now this I know right hand side what it is and the left hand side I have um, I am rearranging the terms now uh, a naught I will collect the coefficient of a naught are collected that is r1 plus r2 plus rn a1 is this it am is this and this continues. Now I will now compare the coefficients of a naught a1 a2 a3 on both sides I will get a set of equations now for this to be equal coefficient of a naught here is 1 and coefficient of a naught here is this this should be satisfied and similarly coefficient of 8, uh, eight uh, a, this is a0 a1 there is 0 here so that must be 0. So by writing this we can write as many equations as you want suppose if you are if you consider 2n equation there will be 2n unknowns what are the 2n unknowns r1 r2 rn first set then u1 u2 un two. so that constitute 2n unknowns. Now you can you select these 2n equations and solve for those 2n unknowns and that gives you the representation that you are looking for but how do you solve for that this is a set of nonlinear equations uh, you can see quadratic terms here so they are nonlinear equations but there is a nice result which shows that if phi of u is a polynomial of degree not higher than 2n minus 1 then this u1 u2 un which are the points where I want to evaluate the function according to the prescription that I just outlined would turn out to be the zeros of Legendre polynomials Pn of u 
that means these u's will satisfy this equation. So the roots and these roots are real. So once these roots are determined, if I know u1, u2, un, then the remaining n unknowns, which are r1, r2, rn, can be solved by solving a linear problem. Is it okay? So I can find this <coughs> uh, constants as I wish. So if you are dealing with a polynomial, then if you retain adequate number of terms, you will be evaluating the integral exactly. There is no approximation at all. Okay. Now, for example, n equal to three. We have this is the rule according to which we want to evaluate. Uh, so, if you expand this now for n equal to three and carry out this differentiation, I get this equation. So, it turns out that the roots of the equations are u equal to zero and plus minus half square root three by five. So the first point I have to select is this, second one is 0, third point is this. With these weights if I add and evaluate the integral, so 2n minus 1 means 4, uh, 6 minus 1, a fifth order polynomial will be exactly evaluated by these weights okay? because a function is polynomial. Now I have done a few calculations here uh, for different values of n. Uh, the roots, these are the roots of the uh, uh, Legendre polynomial. This is uh, for n equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and these are the weights. Okay. So, if you are implementing this, you can use this information to do this. Now, we can see how this, uh, how this formula perform. Now, if I want to evaluate integral minus 1 to plus 1, the answer is 2. So, if I take one term, it gives the exact answer. So the rule is a polynomial of order p is integrated exactly by employing n number of terms which is smallest integer greater than 0 0.5 p plus 1. So now x, so 1, so p plus 1 is 2, you need at least one term. If you use one term, you will get exact solution but this is of course 0 because it is a uh, odd function under symmetric limits, there is no problem. But you come here, p equal to 2. So 2 plus 1 is 3, 1.5, I need at least 2 terms before I can get the value of the integral correctly. So if you see here, if I take only 1 point, uh, I get answer as 0 which is wrong. If I get 2 points, this is the exact answer, x cube by the whatever, you can quickly do this, uh, we get for n equal to the right answer. Similarly 3, of course there is no problem, 4, this is 4 plus 1, 2.5, I should have at least 3 terms. So with 0, uh, 1 term I get 0, 2 terms I get 0 0.22 and this is 0 0.4. Now 6, 6 plus 1, 7, 3.5 I would need at least 4 terms to get that. So 0 0.2857 is the exact answer, 1 does not give a good answer, 2 is this answer, 3 is this, 4 gives the exact answer. So you can quickly verify these things, uh, the information needed uh, to check this table are here. Now, what we now will return to the evaluation of uh, uh, the integrals. Uh, this is a mass matrix, and as using the first result, I will be able to write in this form. Okay, uh, upon transformation, that is our first uh, uh, set of results that we got. Now, how do we evaluate this integral? Is a question. Now, we propose to evaluate this integral using Gauss quadrature. So for that to, uh, to do that correctly, I should know the order of the uh, function uh, the, which is this integrand. That means we, uh, how does n transpose n into determinant of j vary with respect to eta and xi. If I know that, then I will be able to select the uh, correctly the number of integration points. Otherwise, I will again as you saw here if you are integrand is x to the power of 6 and if you happen to take n equal to 3, you will not get a right answer, you have to take n equal to 4. Because you know this rule, you will be able to make this choice. Now we have to now work through uh, the evaluation of this determinant of the Jacobian. So what we know right now, Jacobian is given by this, Jacobian of the transformation, x we are writing like this and y we are writing like this. So given this, I can now substitute for uh, these derivatives in terms of nj's. 
and using this expression I will be able to write J as product of 2 matrices. The first matrix is matrix contains derivatives of N1 and N2 with respect to Xi and eta and second matrix contains the uh, coordinates of the nodes okay. So all these quantities are known so we can go ahead and perform the calculation. You can, if you can uh, uh, it is qu quite straightforward to do this if you do this I get J to be in this form where uh, E1, E2, F1, F2 uh, and F3 are explained here in terms of nodal coordinates. So moment I have this I can evaluate the determinant of J and it turns out to be this uh, and interestingly it turns out that the determinant of J in this case is a linear function of X and eta it is precisely this that I wish to uh, determine then only I will know which order of integration I need to implement. We knew the order of n transpose n because we know entries in n uh, so we know what order uh, that product would be but we did not know what was the order of uh, this j is I mean we did not even know whether it is linear or not first of all. So if we now uh, look into this we see that it is a biquadratic or a bicubic function depending on which terms you are looking at. So using the rule that we are using uh, a 2 by 2 array of integration points would be adequate to perform this integration. So mass matrix can be evaluated exactly uh, by using Gauss quadrature with 2 by 2 uh, Gauss quadrature point mesh. How about stiffness matrix? So I need here B transpose DB into the Jacobian. So again uh, I need to perform some calculations here. So I, this D matrix has to operate now. So I need this uh, information do by do psi is do x by do psi into do by do x plus do y by do psi into do by do y etc and this if we put in the matrix form uh, I have this uh, vector of gradient do by do psi and do by do eta and this is the Jacobian matrix this. So I can either write this or the inverse of this I can express do by do x and do by do y in terms of do, do by do psi and do by do eta through J inverse. Now B recall B was this for this problem so we get after multiplication I get this and uh, it turns out that the quantity that we are looking for is given in this form okay. So elements of B transport DB into determinant of J are ratios of biquadratic functions and linear functions uh, see there is an inverse here. So uh, there is therefore the if you look at individual terms they would not be polynomials they will be ratios of polynomials okay it turns out they are ratios of biquadratic functions and linear functions. So this would mean Gauss quadrature would not be able to evaluate elements of KE in an exact manner. So if you use Gauss quadrature to evaluate this uh, we are uh, introducing certain approximation but Gauss quadrature is so convenient uh, we will make some discussion on this uh, uh, subsequently. But right now the recommendation based on experience is use a 2 by 2 Gauss quadrature uh, we will come to this slightly later once again okay. So uh, summary is mass matrix gets evaluated exactly and stiffness matrix there will be an approximation. Now this is I have used now a four noded quadratic element now the question is if you are using discretization uh, if you are uh, modeling any structural behavior how do you improve upon the accuracy. One way is stick to four noded quadrilateral elements and use more of them that means refine the mesh introduce more number of elements and do that. The other way is use a higher order polynomial to interpolate the field variables if you want to do that it amounts to increasing the number of nodes in an element. So instead of having four noded element we can have eight noded element okay so then when I interpolate the interpolation functions will be of the higher order polynomials they would not be what we saw for a four noded element because now there are addition additional nodes that come into our formulation suppose uh, I, I take this um, 
I will as before I will retain these three nodes and introduce additional nodes at the midpoint of each of these elements. Again we will transform this to a square region and evaluate the uh, elements of um, stiffness and mass matrices using Gauss quadrature. So, this is a 8 noded quadrilateral element with 16 degrees of freedom. Now, the field variable now needs to be represented in terms of the nodal values and there are 8 nodal values for u. So, if you go back here for a u1, u2, u3, u4, u5, u6, u7, u8. So, I have to utilize all of that to interpolate u of a x comma y comma t uh, uh, you know uh, to, rep, uh, to facilitate the development of this element. Now similarly v is represented like this. Now using the logic that we already discussed uh, we need not have to go into all, all the details every time uh, for we get these interpolation functions which have this Kronecker delta property uh, for nodes 1 to 4 I get this is the interpolation function for 5 and 7 these are the interpolation functions and 6 and 8 we get this. Now I, I would not like to get into all the details of the formulation of these integrands but if you indeed perform all that you will be able to notice that you need to use 3 by 3 Gauss integration points with a 3 by 3 mesh mass matrix is evaluated exactly but the stiffness matrix continues to be uh, evaluated approximately. <laughs> now, how about a, this is a rectangular element, the, this is a, the, this discussion is not for this element, this is for the, the, this discussion uh, is for a rectangular element. For a quadrilateral element the same formulary works uh, except now that the x and y also need to be interpolated using the same shape functions. Okay. So, in this case it turns out we need to use 4 by 4 Gauss integration. Uh, points in evaluating uh, stiffness and mass matrices and if you use 4 by 4 mesh the mass matrix is evaluated exactly. So, the mesh size that you need to select uh, should be such that the mass matrix uh, elements of mass matrix matrix are evaluated exactly. See mass matrix elements turn out to be polynomials uh, because n transpose n uh, remains as polynomial whereas here because of um, the, the Jacobian also of course would play a role uh, but here because of this uh, uh, you know various operations involved here uh, the k matrix there will be difficulties as we saw uh, while before. Now let us return to uh, the shear wall and earth dam example that we considered in the previous lecture. So the problem was there is a shear wall of thickness 0 0.2 to 86 meters and these are the dimensions and the problem was to find first 5 natural frequencies and normal modes. Now analytical uh, uh, estimates of natural frequencies using Timoshenko beam theory uh, were uh, obtained uh, were pointed out these were the numbers these are frequencies in hertz. Now uh, we, we discussed this uh, uh, model in the previous lecture we used 64 elements uh, with first order elements that means we used 4 noded quadra, uh, quadrilateral elements actually they were rectangular elements here and the degrees of freedom uh, that the model had was 160. Now what I have done is we have retained the same mesh and same uh, uh, element configuration but now the elements are uh, modified to be uh, second order elements that means they are now 8 noded uh, quadrilateral elements. So, the degree of freedom increases to now 448 and the natural frequencies from 5.03 I come to 4.95 and these numbers change and you can see here they are uh, reasonable uh, the, uh, if this is believed to be correct because it is an analytical solution and the structure uh, structural geometry satisfies the requirements for the uh, applica application of Timoshenko beam theory. So, consequently we can trust this result. Uh, so, uh, and this analytically derived. So, we see that the first natural frequency is much better approximated than this. Uh, similarly, the other uh, uh, you know frequencies also get represented better. So, these are the mode shapes 
first four more shapes are shown here. So you can see that now uh, the more shapes are uh, smoother because they are represented with greater detail within an element. This is the tenth mode. Uh, higher modes become uh, a representation of higher modes would uh, would not be so smooth as it uh, as it is seen here. Uh, if if we had used uh, uh, the first order element, this mode would not be as smooth as it is seen here. Now, this earth dam problem. Uh, it was a triangular wedge uh, model using plane strain approximation, and these were the uh, properties Poisson's ratio 0.45 this is the density and this is the Young's modulus. With uh, triangular elements with uh, 42 elements and 42 degrees of freedom we got these natural frequencies and uh, if you use a shear beam model and, and this is analytical estimate of the shear beam uh, natural frequency this is available in terms of uh, Bessel's functions and then exact solution to this is available. So based on that these numbers have been computed. Now this we have done in the last class. Now what I have done now is uh, this analysis is with first order triangular elements. Now this analysis is with second order triangular although I did not discuss the formulation of second order quadrilateral element the logic is conceptually quite similar to what we briefly mentioned for uh, quadrilateral elements. So if I uh, use this same number of elements but the order has increased so degrees of freedom will increase so the frequency is now change and uh, the first frequency is if we have to believe this, this is 1.25, this is 1.227 and this seems to be moving towards that. But mind you this is also an approximation to this behavior of this wedge. Uh, so the uh, underlying assumptions of shear beam uh, behavior must be satisfied by this structure. So uh, it is difficult to uh, you know pass a clear judgment on uh, which of these two are exact. Now these are the mode shapes uh, from a higher order uh, element uh, this is the first mode and fifth mode this matches with what we did with uh, coarser element uh, I mean first order element. Now in this illustration I am using a okay, combination of triangle and quadrilateral elements this is quadrilateral element this, is, this here we are using triangular elements. So uh, this is again first order elements. So there are 32 elements 56 degrees of freedom and we get natural frequencies like this. So this is just for uh, you know illustration and these are the more shapes uh, that we obtain from this model. Now what I do I will repeat this exercise using the same mesh instead of first order element I will use second order element. So this quadrilateral element here has 4 no 8 nodes and 8 degrees of freedom the triangular elements here will have uh, six degree, six nodes and twelve degrees of freedom. So number of elements remain the same. There are two hundred and ten degrees of freedom, and I get uh, 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 different sets of estimates for natural frequency. So these are the mode shapes for the two uh, first and the fifth mode. Now, so far what we have discussed is basically free vibration problems. Now if, if we have to uh, consider forced vibration response we need to uh, worry about um, how the equivalent forces are computed. So let me just uh, the basic uh, rule for that is uh, this okay. So to explain this what we will do is we will consider a uh, <coughs> Suppose there is a edge two three in a triangular element, and this is the loads will be in the plane of the element. It is a plane stress problem. Suppose the, at any point here there is a load P X and load. Uh, sorry this load p y now when we formulate the uh, the finite element model we also need to assemble the 
nodal forces first of all we should evaluate the equivalent nodal forces. So what we do is we have this over the surface of the element d delta u delta v transpose p x p y into d s. Now we also have the approximation u v which is n into u e. So now uh, we write delta w e in for the nodal in terms of the equivalent nodal forces these are the forces that are acting on the surface I want to represent them in terms of equivalent nodal forces. So we demand that equivalence of these two will give me the expression F e equal to See, I have to consider the edge two three. I am assuming, if you saw, uh, if you uh, recall, we are considering force on the edge two three. So this has to be related along that edge. So if I do this, we will get F e for the example that we have considered as half length of two three into zero 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 p x p y p x p y transpose. So what we are getting is at the two nodes half of the load comes here half of the load goes there as per this uh, formulation. So this is uh, what the equivalent nodal forces uh, the logic for computing equivalent nodal force. So this can be done for quadrilateral elements and uh, 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 rectangular and quadrilateral elements as well. So at some point we will uh, illustrate this. Um, with some examples. Now in the subsequent uh, uh, lectures what we will do now so far what we have done is we have dealt with um, a 3D beam element with 2 nodes and 6 DOF per node. Now we have now considered 2D uh, continuum we have derived different elements. Now the generalization uh, for further analysis now there are 3 things that we can do uh, this beam theory will be uh, get extended to plate and shell. This 2D continuum we can consider now 3 dimensional problems that means when conditions of plane stress and plane strain are not satisfied here another 2D uh, model becomes uh, possible that is axisymmetric solids and then 3D solids. So what in the uh, remaining uh, next few lectures what we will do is we will develop the uh, structural matrices for uh, these problems and these problems and at the end of it I will at the end of these developments I will make a, a few remarks on choice of shape functions and uh, their role on how the answers converge. Now we will uh, consider uh, the question of how to compute equivalent nodal forces uh, we will quickly recall what we did for a beam element. Uh, so this is a beam element uh, say 2 dimensional beam element deforming in its own plane uh, this is the distributed load f of x comma t. So uh, discretization of this uh, element we had 2 nodes and for 2 degrees of freedom per node u1, u2, u3, u4 were the 4 degrees of freedom for the element. The problem uh, here is 
see the displacement field is uh, represented in terms of nodal displacement and these interpolation functions. So, how do we represent this distributed load in terms of equivalent nodal forces? So, how to find P1, P2, P3, P4 uh, in a way that these uh, form an equal uh, there is an equivalence between this load and this set of uh, loads. So, what we considered was a, a virtual displacement uh, and uh, that we represented in terms of virtual nodal uh, displacements multiplied by the interpolation functions and the work done was equated. So, the work done by um, virtual displacements on this set of forces and the virtual displacement uh, uh, on this uh, by this set of forces are equated and by uh, manipulating the terms uh, we uh, determined the nodal forces to be given by these expressions. So, we are going to do something similar for even um, two dimensional elements. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, suppose P x and P y are the distributed loads along the edge 2 3. Now, I want to find out uh, what is the equivalent uh, nodal forces because of these forces. So, P x and P y are distributed along uh, this edge 2 3. So, the uh, virtual work is given by this expression and the displacement field we are interpolating uh, in terms of nodal degrees of freedom as shown here. Now, along this edge, uh, so this uh, virtual work can be written in terms of virtual displacement and applied forces as shown here and this is our representation. So, the virtual work which is this is also equal to uh, virtual nodal displacements into uh, the, these forces and after we manipulate this uh, we get um, this expression uh, and we should note that this uh, trial functions need to here we need to be uh, evaluate this along the edge 2 3. Now, this is the um, uh, virtual nodal displacements into the uh, nodal forces and by equating these two we get uh, the uh, by equating this and this we get the expression for equivalent nodal forces uh, which is shown here. Now, here we have assumed that uh, P x and P y are constant along the edge otherwise uh, there will be a quadrature that has to be implemented. The subscript L 2 the, the quantity L 2 3 represent length of the edge uh, 2 3 this length. So, if you know the nodal coordinates you can derive that length uh, in a straightforward manner. Now, we can make some remarks um, first is the quadrature rule that we discussed uh, the, uh, was in the context of a scalar integral. Uh, this can be the same formulation can also be ex uh, extended to uh, two dimensional integrals and one gets uh, quadrature rule of this form. Now, in this uh, calculation of uh, uh, equivalent nodal forces we considered surface tractions, but if there are equivalent uh, if there are body forces within the element. Uh, we can denote them by f x f y transpose. Um, suppose if that body force is constant within the element how we can find the equivalent nodal forces that again we have to use the same formulation. Uh, I leave this as an exercise uh, this will be the equivalent nodal forces and here again we need to evaluate this uh, integral and we need to examine the order of uh, terms in the integrand and decide upon the quadrature rule, uh, but this can this needs to be evaluated. Uh, again using Gauss quadrature. Now, a small exercise. Uh, so, let us consider a four noded linear rectangular element. Now, we consider the displacements uh, in the discussion so far we considered this part. Now, to this I will now add two more terms alpha 1 1 minus uh, x i square alpha 2 1 minus eta square and similarly for v I will add this. Now, you can see here that at the nodes which are psi x i equal to plus minus 1 and eta equal to plus minus 1 these terms are 0. So, this is like a bubble function. Uh, so, they do not affect the uh, behavior of uh, u near the nodes at the nodes and v is given by uh, this similarly. So, now again these trial functions are same as what we have used for a linear rectangular element. Now, these alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3, alpha 4 are not nodal displacements now they are generalized coordinates. So, there will be now um, uh, 12 degrees of freedom for the element uh, for u uh, nodal displacement u 1, u 2, u 3, u 4 and two generalized coordinates alpha 1 and alpha 2. Similar, this is 6 for u 
similar six quantities for V. Now the exercise that uh, uh, that is being suggested is uh, use the energy expressions and obtain the 12 by 12 stiffness matrix and eliminate this alpha 1, 2, 3, 4 in terms of the nodal degrees of freedom using static condensation and obtain a 8 by 8 stiffness matrix. Uh, and also examine are the displacement fields continuous across the element boundaries. So this, uh, this exercise uh, can be uh, carried out. So in uh, using this element uh, you may notice that um, uh, we, we can continue to use the uh, consistent mass matrix that was derived uh, using only this approximation. Uh, uh, the, uh, kinetic energy can be characterized using only this and whereas Mm, the displacement fields will be character um, the kinetic uh, strain energy will be computed by an alternative representation. Now in the subsequent uh, mm, lectures now uh, we will now consider problems of three dimensional elasticity we have briefly discussed this uh, uh, earlier so we will quickly recall uh, so stress uh, state of stress is now described in terms of six stress components either it can be arranged as a ten, uh, matrix or a vector like this these are the strain components and for an uh, isotropic linearly elastic material the stress and strain are related through this relation and this is the uh, matrix D and we have the expression for strain energy uh, and kinetic energy. So, uh, this is sigma transpose epsilon dv naught is the expression uh, integral of that over volume element into half is a strain energy and this is a kinetic energy. Now to compute strain energy we can uh, now uh, what we are doing is we are expressing sigma in terms of strain uh, and the strain subsequently we will express in terms of displacement as we have been doing this is a strain displacement relation for small deformations and substituting that uh, we will get displacements as n into u e where u e are the nodal displacements and uh, consequently epsilon is obtained uh, uh, in this form where uh, B is equal to this matrix into N. So uh, uh, given that we will have the expression for strain energy and kinetic energy in terms of assumed displacement fields as given here and we need to now carry out this integration over the volume elements. Now the volume elements in a three dimensional solid uh, becomes more diverse we can have a tetrahedron or a rectangular hexahedron or a pentahedron or an isoparametric hexahedron and the, we can also have isoparametric versions of tetrahedron and pentahedron and these are these can be first order elements or higher order elements so there is a uh, great diversity of elements so we can examine some of them as we go along. Subsequently in three dimensional problems uh, we can also consider uh, solids of revolution uh, these are called axisymmetric problems uh, we will be uh, doing that. Um, and we will develop at least one element for this type of applications and this would be followed by a discussion on a plate bending element. So this is a thin say lamina which carries now transverse loads in addition to the inline loads. So uh, the action of this transverse loads on this um, uh, lamina is to uh, the plate is to uh, um, uh, induce bending and uh, about x and y uh, axis and uh, we need to formulate the correct expressions for uh, strain energy and kinetic energy and develop the elements. So we will take up these exercises in the following lectures and maybe some examples on uh, forced response analysis. So with this we will conclude this uh, today's lecture. Mm -hmm.